My name's Alex Finley and I'm on the committee of the IG. Welcome to today's webinar to be given by Adam Matthews, an exploration geologist from Cornish Lithium, on Cornish Lithium's shallow geothermal water exploration. Just a few notes before we start. All previous webinars are available on our YouTube channel and there's a link to this in the chat box. Um, feedback and volunteers are always welcome for future webinars. Please don't hesitate to get in touch. Contact details are again available on our website. There's a link to this in the chat box as well. Today's talk will be about 30 minutes, giving plenty of time for questions and answers afterwards. If you do have a question, please could I ask you to put it in the Q&A box rather than the chat box, just as it makes it easier for us to see them and make sure they all get asked and put over. And with that, I'll hand over to Adam. Thank you very much. Thanks, Alex. I see quite a few familiar names in the participants, so uh, welcome. But um, if you don't know me, I'm project geologist or exploration geologist at um, Cornish Lithium, and I focus mainly on the shallow geothermal waters part of the um, company. Um, as I'll get into in a bit later, there's a few sectors to the company. Um, but for this presentation, I'll be mainly focusing on the shallow geothermal uh, water exploration. So most exciting slide. Oh, it's not even moving. Uh, there we go, most exciting slide. But we'll move on to uh, why, why we're here really doing this. So as everyone's aware, there's, you know, global warming, climate change and everything like that. And um, we're having this clean energy transition where we're having more um, green renewable energy sources like wind, solar panels. Um, and obviously the energy stored in that will go into batteries. So obviously batteries are a big part of this revolution as well, but batteries are also part of um, the green vehicle kind of revolution to electric vehicles. So all of these um, sectors are kind of driving this clean energy transition. Um, so if we move on to wind, for example, you can see that they want to increase the capacity of wind um, for 73% within the next couple of years, looking at 839 gigawatts of power capacity again within the next couple of years. Let's put that into um, some context. Um, 15 megawatts um, is enough to power a small town. And by about 2025, they're hoping to produce 300 meter tall wind turbines, which individually will produce 13 to 15. Um, megawatts of power so one wind turbine will be enough to power um, a small town obviously only when it's windy but that's where the batteries come in and they can store um, <clears throat> the energy required and then they can when it's less windy um, uh, the towns will still have an energy supply but obviously you can see in here to, to actually make these you need uh, copper steel concrete rare earth elements aluminium zinc and molybdenum um, just to create a wind turbine. If you move to uh, solar panels, again, solar panel technology is uh, rapidly becoming more efficient and therefore people are more likely to be um, using solar panels in the future. So usually as well when it's less windy, there's more sun, so they kind of go hand in hand. And again, that's where the batteries come in. But you can see here, again, aluminium, silicon, copper, silver, tin and lead all being used within solar panels. And the percentages may look small here, but actually 7% of uh, global silver demand um, is used in solar panels. So if we move on to batteries where this energy will be stored, there's usually three parts to a battery. There's the anode, which is usually a graphite product, um, the electrolyte, which is usually a lithium salt, and the cathode, which usually has multiple um, different elements within it. Again lithium being one of the major uh, metals used here for, for batteries. So there's a common theme with this energy transition that to actually be able to produce green energy, we need to mine um, copper, tin, lithium, which, you know, worldwide mining usually gets quite a, a bad rep. Um, so, you know, there's going to be a lot of people saying, well, if you want um, green technology, why are we doing more mining um, and the evidence is is there on those previous slides that we need to find new well new sources of these metals to continue the supply to try and meet this demand so what is this demand going to look like over the next few years 
So you can see up there, lithium, this is um, a source of visual capital, uh, cap capitalist, so I can't speak. Um, <clears throat> this is from 2017, but the trends are the same. So lithium, they're expecting by 2050 that demand will increase by approximately 965%. And again, cobalt, graphite, indium, vanadium, and nickel all have over double the um, demand over the next um, 30 years. So even if we look at the smaller ones, we've got silver, neodymium, molybdenum, aluminium, copper, and manganese. Just looking at copper there, 7% increase in demand. But what does that actually look like? So in the last 5,000 years, 550 million tons of copper has been produced. Um, but in the next 25 years, the, that same amount of copper would have needs to be used or be produced to kind of start meeting the demands of the, the new technologies. So there's this incredible demand on these, um, these metals now, especially lithium, cobalt, um, which are going to be used in batteries for electric vehicles and renewable energy storage. <clears throat> so a lot of this is being driven by the government. So here in the UK, um, it's predicted that we'll have about 125 to 200 million uh, electric cars on the road within the next nine years. And this is being driven by the UK government wanting to ban the production of all new petrol and diesel vehicles by 2030. And this deadline seems to be um, decreasing by the year. A few years ago, it was by 2040 or maybe even 2045. So they're really pushing this deadline, um, which is putting a lot of stress on the resource sector to actually try and produce the lithium and other raw materials required to actually meet these demands. Um, so just lithium alone, the, the market in the UK is expected to be worth about 5 billion. And as we saw in the previous supply, uh, slide, we know within the next uh, 30 years, really, the demand is going to be up towards almost 1,000% for lithium. And this is quite a big uh, concern because in Europe, there is currently no active battery-grade lithium extraction at all. Uh, most of the battery-grade lithium comes from China. Um, and the UK currently imports most of its raw materials. So one of the big goals for Cornish Lithium is to try and create a domestic um, supply of lithium um, to help uh, drive this uh, car industry and renewable en energy industry in the UK. Um, but not necessarily just lithium. You know, Cornwall has a lot of potential with other metals as well, like copper. It was one of the biggest copper and tin mining districts in the world at the time, in the 1800s. Um, so there is a lot of potential down here in Cornwall um, to, to try and help with this uh, limit here, which is the there's no um, battery grade lithium or really we're importing most of our raw materials. So we're going to try and tackle that. So moving to Cornish Lithium, like what, what do we actually do? Well, the company is broadly split um, into four kind of uh, categories or projects. Um, there's a sh shallow lithium enriched earth and waters, which is what I work on. Uh, and that's what the company started um, looking at when it first incorporated in 2016. Um, we also have the deep lithium enriched earth and waters projects, which effectively is the same as shallow. But when you're looking at the deep, which is over five kilometers in depth, um, because it's warmer, you're going to have higher concentrations of lithium within your waters because it dissolves um, more metals but you're looking at oil and gas technology. So to drill boreholes, it's costing you tens to hundreds of millions of pounds to drill one borehole, whereas in the shallow, it's costing you hundreds of thousands to drill one borehole. So they're the same resource, but on an econo economy point of view, um, they've been separated uh, due, due to different types of drilling costs, really. The other thing that we look at is um, lithium in hard rock. And we've currently got a project in St. Austell in the Chalapa pit. Um, we're currently drilling there, um, doing diamond drilling and RC drilling to create a resource. Um, so this lithium in hard rock is essentially lithium hosted within micas within the granite. And um, what you can see is obviously there's also lithium in the lithium waters as well. So what we find is where there's joints going through the granite, the lithium is 
preferentially going into the water. So then we're, we're tackling both um, parts of the resource where we've got the lithium within hard rock, where we think is the, the true source of the lithium, but where the water's coming through those faults, water preferentially prefers water, uh, lithium preferentially prefers water. So then that lithium is going into that water and we can also um, look to extract that resource as well at the same time. The other opportunity that we're evaluating is other metals. So that's copper, tin, um, lead, cobalt, um, whatever. Um, there seems to be every metal in Cornwall, really. Um, but that, that image you can see there is um, one of the highest grade copper loads ever seen, really, um, which we intercepted in our shallow geothermal water drilling because the two come hand in hand. Shallow geothermal water circulate within naturally permeable faults. And it so happens that a copper load was one of those naturally, um, circulate, naturally permeable faults. So uh, uh, Cornish metals, um, formerly known as Strongbow Exploration, are currently evaluating uh, that particular intercept, but we are looking at other um, areas as well. So from this point um, of the presentation, I'll mainly focus on the shallow geothermal waters, as that's my kind of cup of tea, but um, I will um, talk about some of the deep and other projects as well as we go through. So back in 2016, this is kind of the piece of data which started Cornish Lithium off. Um, we can see there in the bottom right hand corner, this is a section, cross section through United Mines from um, 1800s and it says temperature of the deep levels in the mine is remarkable at the 230 fathom level, the water is 124 degrees Fahrenheit. So that is equivalent in modern day language at about 450 meters below surface. The water is about 51 degrees Celsius. And the water issuing or the hot water issuing is rich in lithia. So what this is showing us is that there's hot water entering the mine at depth and that water is rich in lithium. So that's kind of where the company started. And one of my first tasks joining the company was to read far too many 1800s old English uh, reports to work out where all of these hot springs may occur in Cornwall and make put together a database. Um, so using all of that information, we developed a concept um, which is as follows. So shallow geothermal waters, we think, convect or circulate within permeable geological faults. Maybe their, their upwelling is driven either thermodynamic thermodynamically or by the hydraulic gradient, but either raw within permeable faults, and that it's potential to intercept those permeable faults um, using conventional drilling, isolate them, and take a geothermal water sample um, underneath where they'd historically been observed in mine workings. So you can see on this schematic section, we've got the mine workings up there. We would have had historic data points as seen on the previous section, and we can drill beneath to try and intercept some of those hot springs they observed um, back in the 1800s. So obviously I said we put together a large database. The um, place that we decided to try and prove this concept was United Downs. Um, so here's a picture of the drill rig and there, there's me standing in the foreground. Um, what we looked to do here, that this was the place where there was the most uh, highest concentration of data available um, for us to try and just prove this concept. All we wanted to do to start with was just prove that we could intercept geothermal fluids circulating within permeable faults and be able to take a sample because that's something that's not really thought of in the mining industry, always looking to mine rock rather than water. Um, so we kind of had to prove that it was possible to start with. So we drilled uh, two, or we cored two boreholes at United Downs in HQ3 diameter, which was about 96 millimeters. And the aim was to intercept the thermal structure and extract lithium geothermal waters. The main target structure was hot load, and that was on that previous section I showed you. Um, and surprise, surprise, hot load, that was because there was lots of hot water going up that structure. And that, my, that structure was a copper load, um, very rich um, in copper. And uh, the, the reason why, um, that mine stopped was because of the inundation of hot water. The, the miners couldn't stay down there for any more than 15 minutes because the 51, 52 degrees Celsius water constantly coming out of the structure and um, effectively burning them whilst they're mining. So that's why that mine closed. 
um, but we uh, we went to intercept that structure beneath those mine workings to try and find these geothermal fluids. So when we were drilling, we collected a few pieces of information. Obviously, the chemistry of the fluids, the hydrogeolog hydrogeological conditions, um, the wireline geophysics logs, and we did some core scanning with a company called Geotech um, on our call afterwards. So what does these structures what do these structures look like that we intercepted? So here's an example. This is uh, um, about 640 meters within the first hole, uh, second hole we drilled. And this is hot load. And as what you can see is a, a gryotonized granite to start with, with some quartz chlorite veining, and chalcopyrite and pyrite. Then around 640 meters, we hit the major load structure and effectively it is chlorite with massive chalcopyrite, chalcosite, pyrite, arsenic pyrite um, throughout. And you can see that the load is much longer than two meters in this example. And what's most important for us is you can see the sheer quantity of bugs and kind of gravel that um, it's in that structure. And that, that's real. All those bugs are naturally there. Um, the gravel is kind of where there's some core loss. Um, so this was really promising. And you can see on the core box written there, just after 900, uh, 640 meters, there's total fluid loss. That's one of our initial indicators that we've uh, intercepted something um, permeable because the drillers don't get their fluids back whilst they're drilling, they lose them. And then therefore we know that that structure is permeable. So what we would do in this situation was, was drill through the structure until we're happy that we're through it. And then we would in initiate our sampling strategy, which I will talk about in, in a bit. So this is what some of those wireline geophysics logs look like. This is uh, televiewer data. And we didn't do any oriented core, firstly because the core was too steep. We did it the borehole about 85 degrees. And at the same time, there's lot we knew we were expecting lots of core loss because of the permeability. So orientated core isn't very useful in that kind of scenario. So we ran some televiewer logs, which are effectively a um, image of the borehole. And you can see sinusoidal curves on the on the logs. And these are the joints, it's effectively an unwrapped 3D image. So the the lowest point of sinusoidal curve is the dip direction, and the amplitude is the um, dip of the structure. Um, we can see there that there's a 20 centimeter open vein. So what this allows us to do in the core, we wouldn't we wouldn't see that. That's just um, it would just be attributed as core loss. But here we can see in situ exactly where that 20 centimeter void occurs, and we can see that it's actually along a joint or a vein of some sort. So we know that these are structurally, this is structurally controlled permeability. When we go down a bit further, we see a two meter void space. Um, when we're drilling this, I was like, where's all the core gone? We lost two meters of it. But when we get a televiewer logs, we can see, okay, again, it's structurally controlled permeability. So how much water can, can flow through a two meter void? That's quite a lot. And you know, we, we were seeing extreme permeability in this area. Um, so this you can see on the right is the, borehole geometry, the second ring is the standard size of the borehole. So we can see that the borehole width has greatly increased in these areas. And the little tadpole plot on the right, um, the orientation of the, the tag is the dip direction and the position of it along that graph is the asthma. Um, this is some of the geotech data that we've done. So this is a CT scan of the core, um, dense plot, dense, Parts of the CT scan is obviously going to be sulfides and very, um, not very dense parts are going to be bugs. So we can see the animation on the right, the dark is generally the bugs and the, uh, sorry, I don't know what's going on there. And then the uh, golden color is, is the sulfides. And we can see on the raw CT image on the left, we can kind of start to analyze what these bugs look like in 3D um, without having to do any cutting of the core. We, We'll just surely do it through um, CT scanning and we can move these um, wherever we want within the core. We can set the slices wherever we want because it's a 3D volume of density basically. This is really, really good to start analyzing our permeability. So this is our sampling methodology that we, that we developed. Um, effectively what we would do We've got two different methods was well, discrete sample interval, which is what um, we would usually do, where we would drill through one of those permeable faults until we had gone through it. 
we then lower down what's called a packer. Mm -hmm. A packer can be inflated, um, and then that will isolate that interval. We would then put down a pump and pump the water from that interval um, up to surface, and everything um, just comes from that, that interval because it's isolated with the packer. The water comes up through the inside of the rods. The other option was, or other test type we did, was a multi-interval test or combined interval test where that was more simulating what production would be like. So once the borehole was finished, we put the packer towards a nearer the surface and we're able to produce multiple structures and then have some idea of the hydrological properties and chemistry, et cetera, of um, something what production would be like. So as a schematic, um, here's my PowerPoint skills coming into action. We've got topography and water level, and we've got our faults. We would drill down, intercept that fault, position our packer, and the packer is inflated using water. So you can see that the water level there goes up to basically surface because it's going into the drill rig. Once the pressure reaches 800 PSI, the valve in the packer will switch because it's now um, inflated and it'll keep the packer inflated and allow the water to come through into the interval. We can see that potentially, in most of the cases, the water level is actually higher than it was originally. And that is because of the hydrological gradient within that structure. And we believe this is because of it's got an upward hydraulic gradient and therefore it creates a higher water level. And therefore we know that it's upwelling geothermal fluids. We can then lower a pump like this. Um, the graph on the left there is just showing the different water levels in the test intervals and proving that it's upward hydraulic gradient. Once we put down a pump, obviously we then have drawdown. And then from the drawdown, we can then know how much water we've pumped um, at a, a flow rate. And then we understand the permeability of that interval. Again, can be repeated for deeper structures. So we put in the packer, we inflate it again, the water level um, equilibrates, and then we pump and the same information comes. But you can see that only the water from the deeper structure would be pumped, not from the other structure. So this, this was how we were able to create or to obtain um, water chemistry just from each individual sample. Within the packer, we would have a transducer which measures the temperature and pressure of the sampling interval. Um, what you can see here is that the temperature of the sample interval rapidly increases and that's because you're pumping initially out the drilling muds that you pump in. Once then it gets seven o'clock and we all go home, the water level then kind of uh, the water temperature equilibrates back to what uh, its natural temperature. Then when we get back seven o'clock in the morning, turn the pump back on, the water temperature then increases. So then it's again evidence that the water is coming from depth whilst the pumping. And you can see by the blue dots, we um, obviously know the pump rate. So when we take a water sample, we can back calculate the amount of time it's taken to come from the sample interval to the surface. So we know how stable the temperature at least was when we took the sample. So we know roughly how stable that sample is. So chemistry, we haven't published our shallow geothermal water chemistry publicly yet. So this is the historic data, but essentially um, what you see is is that well, it plots on the same, the same line. But what you're seeing is that lithium and total dissolved solids has a very good um, R squared value, it's 0.89. So it's got a very good relationship. Then on the right, you can see that um, as you increase in depth, the lithium grade increases. So that's a pretty obvious relationship. The deeper you go, the hotter it gets, the more you dissolve, that's simple chemistry. And therefore, the more you dissolve, the more lithium you have. And that's why you've got the shallow and the deep projects because shallow, you'll be drilling, getting slightly lower grades, um, but cheaper. And then you've got the deep where you're drilling a uh, much higher cost, but you're getting higher grade. And we're trying to find that balance of the perfect depth to drill um, relative to grade and cost. You can classify those waters um, in this ternary diagram. Um, meteorite waters will generally sit in the middle, more closer to the HCO3. Whereas if it's mine water, you'll plot down there um, in the SO4 section, but then the geothermal water would plot up in the chlorine rich section because um, our waters are very rich in chlorine. Um, so then we, this allows us to know what type of water that we have sampled. And in every case at United Downs, it was 
um, and mature get them water. This is the only data point that we've published, and it is the, the one there, which is UDDGP. That's United Downs Deep Geothermal Power Project. We took a geothermal water sample from their 5.5 kilometer borehole. So this is a deep geothermal system sample. And we can see that the, the grade is over 240 milligrams per litre, which when you can compare it to other geothermal projects, it's the highest grade lithium ever recorded um, in geothermal waters as far as we know. Um, and what we can also see is that the TDS is much lower than those. So we've got a higher grade lithium and lower TDS, which is really good for processing because effectively you need to get rid of less stuff and you have a higher um, lithium grade. So that's really good for processing. And just for some comparison, that little black X or cross in the corner is seawater. So your um, geothermal waters, if you were to taste them, are less salty than seawater, but 1,400 times the lithium concentration. So what would processing look like? This is a deep geothermal example, but the same could be similar for a shallow geothermal system. Pump up, the water will go into a geothermal power plant, the electricity will be used for uh, the grid, um, towns, villages nearby, but the heat could also be used for regional heating schemes, could go into radiators or um, used for horticulture, for growing tomatoes, and that's something that's done in the Netherlands at the moment. Um, and then the water could also go to a lithium pilot plant, or will also go to a lithium pilot plant. The lithium will get extracted from the fluid and then be used in electric vehicles or renewable energy batteries. And the water can then be put back into the ground, or maybe it'll go into regional heating schemes, something like that. This is what um, the, the plan kind of looking like at the moment. So traditionally, uh, geothermal fluids or brines are processed in the following way. The water pumps surface, goes into evaporation ponds. The sun evaporates the water. It leaves behind, well, obviously lithium prefers being in solution. So it leaves behind a lithium concentrated brine, which can then go into the further processing, which then gets transformed into a lithium carbonate. This is what that looks like. You have vast evaporation ponds and you rely on sun um, evaporating away most of the water and other elements. So therefore, this is something that is not feasible in Cornwall because um, it rains too much. But uh, also it's a very big environmental um, issue because they use a lot of water. These areas have to be very dry, um, solar evaporation. Obviously it takes up a lot of room. So um, there's other new modern methods for which to process lithium from geothermal waters, uh, such as direct lithium extraction. So this is one method. Um, however, we're talking to multiple processing technology providers, some of which are there on your right, like Lila, Geo40, Adionics, Precision Periodic, um, but we are speaking mm -hmm. to others as well. So we can see here, one of, the, one of the methods would be you have sorbent beads within a column, the geothermal waters would go in, the lithium would be sorbed onto the beads and the rest of the water would be um, will come out through the, through the bottom of the column and go into regional heating schemes or be injected back into the subsurface. You then put the stage two would be to put a desorbent fluid through the column, which will then take the lithium from the beads and you effectively have just water with lithium. So you've got rid of all of your other um, elements from the water. And then that's much easier to concentrate into a product such as uh, lithium hydroxide or carbonate. <clears throat> so direct lithium extraction, well, carbon intensities for different extraction methods. So we can see hard rock spodumene deposits there. That, um, you know, that's very generic processing, lots of comminution, um, breaking up the rocks, grinding the, and that's, you know, most of the world's energy is used on crushing rocks. So that's some of that there. You can see the carbon intensity of that is extremely high. Whereas if you go to sailor type brines, you have evaporation ponds, much less carbon intensity. However, um, they're still not generating any, um, anything to offset their carbon footprint. Vulcan Energy have predicted, Vulcan Energy are a company who are based in the Rheingraben, um, do something very similar to, to us. Um, and they've estimated that because of the geothermal energy that they'll, they'll produce, the heat that they could produce to local um, towns um, can be offset 
and then their carbon intensity can actually be, um, well, their carbon footprint can be zero to a negative carbon footprint. They'll be given back um, to the environment, which is when we go back to those first slides, when we're looking to have this green transition to electric vehicles, renewable energy, um, having this responsible way of extracting lithium from or other metals from the, the ground is, is really uh, attractive. So what are we doing at the moment? So we've obviously done our proof of concept um, drilling and Cornish Lithium are continuing to develop that program, Ignited Downs, um, trying to start to understand hydrogeology, hydrogeology a bit better. We're also continuing to evaluate um, modern airborne geophysics, remote sensing, drone, map, drone mapping that we've done um, and historic records to try and identify uh, future sites where we can drill and intercept geothermal waters. Um, but we're also started a collaboration between Geothermal Engineering, Engineering Limited, um, which is the deep geothermal power project at United Downs, where that 240 milligrams per litre sample was taken, and ourselves, so collaboration between them and ourselves, and that's funded by the Getting Building Fund um, by the government, and the aim is to produce a pilot plant within the next 12 to 18 months on that site. Um, so that's just kicking off, um, we've got one team member there, so Cornish Lithium working hard to keep that up and running, but they're currently hiring a team of 10 people to, to do that project. So that's another big part of the geothermal work stream at the moment is to get that pilot plant up and running um, the next year or so. So that was a whistle stop tour of uh, the geothermal waters at Cornish Lithium. So if you've got any questions, I'll be pleased to answer them. Well, thank you very much for that, Adam. I found that incredibly interesting. Um, first question that's come up from Ellie Evans at the, uh, off the side, but do you know what the carbon cost of building one of these big wind turbines is, especially looking at with the uh, 1,200 tonnes of concrete needed? Personally, I'm not the person to ask about that. I'm not, I'm not too sure on the carbon um, cost of those at all. Uh, yeah. Sorry, I can't answer. I don't know the answer to that question. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, so I'll just quickly get this done. And I had one, and it's, you know, what really controls the heat and the lithium content in these brines? Is it depth or is it granite rock type, mineralogy, radioactive heat, things like that coming into it as well? Um, so it's all kind of a, we think it's probably something altogether. So obviously Cornwall, we've got this big uh, Canubian batlith underneath Cornwall. Obviously, that's the basement rock, so it's got, going to be producing a lot of radiogenic heat. Um, you have two fault sets in Cornwall. You have the, the north-south trending cross courses, as they call them, um, which is the latest stage of faulting. But earlier to that, you have the east-west trending load structures, which is what we drilled. Cross courses are what um, the geothermal power project drilled. So we know that the geothermal waters is both in, within every fault set. Um, that we tested in Cornwall and also joints from the meta sediment and the granite. So what's probably happening is that this heat at depth is, from the radiogenic heat production is driving some thermal convection, causing that water to come up through the permeable faults. And then we're able to tap into those um, either within the granite or the meta sediment. Um, as long as it's permeable fault, it allows that circulation and upwelling to occur. So hope that answers. Yeah, very much so. Thank you very much. Um, one from Richard Small. Do you have any current indications on the scale of the brine resource, uh, you know, volumetric reserves? Uh, that's a very difficult one to answer. We are working quite hard to try and work out the best way to do that. Obviously, to produce a jaw compliant resource, you have to tick a lot of boxes and um, geothermal resource in this kind of instance has never been made before. So we're working quite hard with companies like SRK to try and develop um, a method for doing that. What we're finding is it's very hard to quantify because we know that it's at five and a half kilometers and we know it's at 600 meters and you know that in the same area. So trying to produce a volume of fluid in that is quite difficult. The way to probably do it is a discrete fraction network. So with that teleview, viewer data, we know the joint orientations of everything. We know the orientations of open joints. We know, we know a lot about the fault network and joint network. So you could probably create a 
discrete fraction network, which is a statistical model, which is stochastic modeling, to understand the volume. And then from that volume, you then could obviously, we know the concentration of the lithium in both the shallow and the deep systems. So we can start to do some modeling of what the, the volumes might be. But the, the best way to, as an initial scale, to understand if something's economic is how, how much water per second or per minute can you pump from a particular structure without drawing down water. So I'm showing you is upwelling water. And then um, when we position that packet, the water level is higher than the normal water level. So when you're pumping, what you want to do is equilibrate that level with the normal water level. And what that means is you're just pumping water from depth. If you go too far and you draw down, then you're going to be um, pumping water from shallower systems. So you want to try and get this balance right. And that's what we're working on. Thank you very much. Questions are flying in at the moment, so we'll try and get through them all. Um, have you detected any, uh, 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 sorry, have you detected any radioactivity in the water sampled? Uh, we have obviously um, done a full suite of chemistry and there, there is no radioactive element at all in the, the water. Okay. Another one from Martin Gillespie. Uh, thank you very much for the presentation. Has anyone worked out when the fracture permeability formed, i.e. when does it fit into the fracture parogenesis story? I think there's multiple different stories um, based on the structure. So obviously we've got lots of different structure types in Cornwall. The stuff that we drilled, probably um, we think it's an oxidative event during um, mineralization. So there's multiple phases of mineralization in Cornwall. So probably oxidative event caused some kind of acidic um, waters which dissolved the sulfides. Lots of that, the bugs that I showed you in that image of the core is dissolution. So that's probably something that's happening, um, but it's not 100% sure yet. Just working on it. And from Alistair Duncan, in terms of mineral royalty rights, who owns the waters from which the lithium is extracted? Um, so Cornish Lithium has lots of mineral rights agreements with mineral holders all over Cornwall, like Tregoston and um, South Crofty, and these big state holders. So the mineral rights owner owns the mineral rights, uh, owns the lithium. So we have agreements with the mineral holders to have access to that lithium. Thank you. And from David Haley, how do you ensure that you don't pump up lithium depleted brine that you have re-injected? Uh, yeah, that's something that we need to start doing some test work on um, when we start re-injecting things in the future. We need to see what the recharge rate would be um, does the water get replenished with lithium when it interacts with the granite again? Um, or does it not? And it, you know, we need to work out which, because obviously if we find out that it doesn't and it's going to dilute, then we would have a different method of using that water. Um, we wouldn't inject it back in. Maybe it would be used for heating schemes and things like that. Um, so obviously we need to work that out. Um, but we wouldn't, we wouldn't uh, re-inject it back in if it was going to ruin the resource. Oops. From Mark Smedley, are there any other areas within the UK with a similar, similar potential? Um, perhaps, yeah, there's um, a few projects that have been published, uh, some drilling in Weirdale, the Weirdale planet. Um, they intercepted very similar structures and they also mm -hmm. showed enriched geothermal, um, well, lithium in geothermal waters, but also other elements as well. Um, so that is an, another area in Cornwall that this could be used. Yeah. And from Chris Rochel, or sorry, if I'm pronouncing everyone's surnames wrong, I do apologise. Uh, what flow rates do you require to make an em economic process at, say, 240 parts per million dissolved lithium? Or another value um, easier for you? Yeah, so, you know, you'd be looking at pumping probably 60, 40 to 60 litres a second, which is what the big processing plants would require. Um, but we need to do some more work on that really to definitely understand it. But that's kind of the initial indications. Thank you. Um, what plans are there to ensure lithium and heat uh, resource sustainability if re-injecting the waste water from, surface, from the surface back underground? Um, can you repeat that, please? Yeah, so what, are the, what plans are there to ensure that the lithium and the heat resource is sustainable if you're re-injecting the water 
the wastewater back in. I think it comes back to um, uh, what's going on, you know, what are your plans with the wastewater if you can't inject it back in? Yeah, I, yeah. I think, you know, what, what we're mainly looking to do um, would be to try and get to net zero carbon. So whatever we do with the wastewater, we're going to try and it's either have, going to have already produce geothermal energy, which will help to supply, give electric supply to the power, the, to the processing plant. Um, either that or it could be used for regional heating schemes or ele um, other electric production. But we try to use, it, not just use the water for lithium, but to try and get the most out of it before it's come back underground. And from Tony Entwistle, is there a significant solid waste production from the extraction processing of the lithium from the brine? Um, we haven't pumped water directly into a processing plant yet to know fully, but we do know that, that for example, if we pump the geothermal waters up and leave them in a sample bottle at surface, then at, when they cool, they'll precipitate um, iron oxide. Um, but that's just because of the temperature change. And from George, could domestic uh, pre-existing boreholes for private water supply be used to explore for lithium? Um, unlikely, because there's a few different uh, water um, sources. You've got obviously mine water, which completely avoiding, but then we've got meteorite water, which is effectively rainwater and the geothermal system. So a public water borehole will be for the meteoric system, um, so the geothermal system is much deeper, um, so they wouldn't be interacting, probably. And again, this is coming back to the water injection again, the re-injection of water, but have you modelled how long it will take for groundwater to become re-enriched in lithium, or will it ever, or do you need geological time? Or is it, a finite, um, is it a finite lithium resource or will it keep recharging? Yeah, we need work still needs to be done on that. There, we have got some um, university partners, I think, looking at that kind of uh, thing where they put in through our water chemistry into Pacific rocks, trying to understand um, that recharge rate. So it's something that we're working on, but I can't give a straight answer right now. Fair enough. And... Is the economic driver geothermal energy and the mineral content bonus, or is it lithium with the geothermal energy being the bonus? I think it depends what company you are. <laughs> um, for us, obviously, we're looking at lithium. Um, so, and obviously, the ge Deep Geothermal Power Project is looking at the geothermal energy. So that's why we've created this kind of collaborative um, company, which is GeoCubed, where we're, we're working together to kind of do both. So, um, obviously, the concentration of each company will be on slightly different thing. I'm getting a fair few questions coming in on a similar vein. Sorry, that's a terrible pun. Um, but what other are you looking at other elements as potential commercial recoverables um, apart from lithium? Yeah, um, of course. Um, there are other elements, obviously, within the water, not just lithium and water. So, yeah, we are evaluating. You know what what can be easily processed as either a byproduct, well, as a byproduct. So for example, could what would be really nice is if we use it for horticulture, then if we can also extract potassium from the water, then we can use that to fertilize for the plants as well as using hot water for the growing tomatoes, as well as producing lithium, as well as producing geothermal energy. Thank you very much. And another one, thank you for the presentation. And do you have a cutoff price for lithium to make this process viable at the moment? And if so, can you share it? Um, I'm not sure right now. I think, like I said, we're mainly working on, initially on flow rates. Um, can we produce enough water without the drawdown? Um, that's kind of our major consideration right now. Okay. That one's been covered. And is there a potential for geothermal energy recovery from North Sea deep mines? And might there be any potential for lithium recovery from saline mine dewatering? I suppose this comes back to some we've you've already answered on other areas of the UK. Uh, yeah, regards to the North Sea, I, I don't know necessarily what the chemistry is, but I do know that 
oil field brines do some some of them do have enriched lithium concentrations. So I think that might be something that you know other companies or you know people might start looking into is old oil and gas reservoirs. Is there brines in there that could be supplied for lithium? <clears throat> as for the as for the point of mines, um, the mine water is again one of those different types of water. It's going to be quite rich in um, sulfuric acids and things like that and be more a mix of uh, meteorite water and um, sulfides so that this would be a different system, hydrological system. And from Ian Brewer, uh, do you have any indication of the potential yield of lithium at this stage? Um, again, that'll come down to my producer resource, I think. Yeah. Fair enough. Um, sorry, I'm trying to check on what I'm doing here. Uh, done that one. And again, uh, is there from Nick Horsley? Is there any scope for geothermal exploration with other faulting in the southwest, for example, Stickle Path Fault in Devon? Um, so that's a really interesting fault. It's absolutely massive, but there's no uh, hardly any data on it really at depth. But um, we are continuing exploration for both deep and shallow. Um, systems. So, like I said, we were looking at offshore symmetry data to understand the fraction network. That's really, really good data. You can really see the faults and the interactions in that. Looking at remote sensing, um, geophysics, doing drone maps of the north coast cliffs so we can look at the faults. Um, and all of these kind of data sets trying to bring them together to work out what is a prospective site for, for future work. So, you know, what we've learned a lot from United Downs is we know that the, why, why the film really might, might be there, what it looks like, um, what alteration minerals can be expected um, but when you're intercepting those kind of pimple faults. So we can use all of this to try and now have a bit more uh, modern approach to looking for these structures. So that's all stuff that we're, we're currently working on quite intensely. And one final question you'll be relieved to hear. Um, and what's really the, uh, you know, with the temperature drawdown, what's the aim for the uh, lifespan of this mine at the moment? Do you have that data? Um, again, we need to understand the size of that resource. So, for example, if, you know, we know it's connected from 600 metres, well, 640 metres at least to 5,500 5, metres in depth, then you need to know the strike and, you know, the the jet of waters are likely to coming deeper than five and a half miles as well. So we need to understand what volume there is first um, and be able to do that in a, a draw plan way, which is trying to work out with SRK at the moment to understand the exact life of mine. Um, just to add a bit more information, you're saying about drawdown. Um, so for example, when we were uh, pumping those intervals, we had less than one meter drawdown when we were pumping. So that's showing that those sampling are extremely permeable. Um, so that's, that's really promising. And those are you know, small well, load structures, which aren't these big north-south faults, which are crossing the whole county. So it'd be really exciting when we uh, ever drill those to see what the permeability in those looks like as well. Well, thank you very much for that, Adam. That was a great talk and quite an intense question and answer se session afterwards. I think one of our most in most questions asked so far. Um, yeah, right. that was great. Thank you very much. No problem. Yeah, I hope you enjoyed. Yeah.